Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show, where you'll find health and fitness inspiration, motivation, and information shared in 15-minute episodes. Tune in while getting a move on to make leading and enjoying the benefits of a healthy lifestyle almost too easy. It's the Fit 15. And now your host, Katherine Basu. Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show. I am your host, Katherine Basu. Today, we are going to be joined by an awesome guest who's going to help us with our nutrition more than our fitness, but that doesn't mean I don't want you to still get up and get moving during today's episode, so I highly encourage you to do that. There is a lot of magic that happens when you get moving for at least 15 minutes, so even if you can't listen for the whole episode, if we run a little over 15 minutes, at the seven and a half minute point, the halfway point of 15 minutes, I will play a little sound bite so that you know you can turn around if you decide to walk with us. All right, today's guest is Sarah Pruitt Sofel. She is a non diet, body positive, registered dietitian nutritionist that empowers clients through insight and information to appreciate their bodies, move more, improve lab values, and understand food and nutrition as one important aspect of a full life. Her special interests include weight issues, family and children's health, plant based diets, and sports nutrition. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. I am so excited to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. So I love chatting with you, Sarah, and learning more about the world of nutrition. But the reason I wanted to have you come on today is that as a personal trainer, I keep getting asked over and over about the ketogenic diet. So I wanted to get your insights on it as a registered dietitian. So maybe to get us started, we could have you share what the ketogenic diet is. Sure. Well, the ketogenic diet is a diet that helps the body change from metabolizing mostly glucose as a source of energy to metabolizing fat as a source of energy. And you do that by eating very high amounts of fat and low carbohydrates. So a typical diet, the average acceptable macronutrient distribution range has about 45 to 65% of carbohydrates daily. And on a ketogenic diet, you want to have less than 15% come from carbohydrates. Wow. Yeah. I'm wondering what would you actually be able to eat? Because I feel like even an apple could get you pretty close to maxing out for the day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So on a typical ketogenic diet, broken down into like grams of carbohydrates per day, some -hmm. people can go into ketosis around 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates a day. Some people need less of that. Some people, when they're starting out on a ketogenic diet, would need like way less than 50 grams a day. And then as they've been in ketosis for longer, can eat more carbohydrates and eat more fruits and vegetables. But when you're first starting out and initiating into a ketogenic diet. And I'm by no means an expert in the ketogenic diet. Sure. But yes, so as you're initiating into it, you may need less and then you can add more fruits and veggies. But yes, it's very high in fat. So a typical day would be breakfast of maybe some ham, bacon, or sausage cooked in some fat like coconut oil, duck fat, or bacon grease with a side of mayo, and maybe like a handful of berries, either raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, something that's like a high fiber fruit that's lower in carbohydrates than say an apple or a pear or a citrus fruit. And then you could maybe have, if you wanted to add more fat to that, you could add like a mayo to the to your breakfast <laughs> with your ham and your bacon. Um, a lot of people on ke- ketogenic diets will have like a bulletproof coffee. Okay. Where, which is basically like brewed coffee with a tablespoon of coconut oil or butter or clarified butter Got it. or MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. Yeah. So that's what a breakfast would look like. A lunch would be like non-starchy veg. So like zucchini or cucumber or tomato, maybe like a small handful of tomatoes and okay. then some like brown meat, chicken cooked in fat as well. And then dinner could be a little portion of protein cooked in fat with gravy and another non-starchy veg like asparagus and kale. Yeah. So that's pretty much what it would look like on a daily, daily <laughs> basis. A lot of fat. And then for snacks could be like 
cream cheese on a vegetable like celery or carrots, okay. beef jerky dipped in coconut oil, just avocado with a little bit of olive oil on top of it. So you're really like pushing up the, the fat content that you're eating. It's mostly fat, not too much protein because protein, they're actually amino acids that are glucogenic, which means that they create glucose or they can be converted into glucose in the body. So if you're having a high protein diet, that's not really going to be ketogenic because your body will find ways to get around to have glucose for your brain. Got it. So I think this is a good point for us to touch on and clarify for people the fact that their brain will find a way, as you mentioned, to take some of those amino acids, which are the smaller units of proteins, and make them into glucose, which is the smaller unit of the carbohydrate macromolecule, the macromolecule that often gets a really bad rap. So could you touch on why carbohydrates as a macromolecule really aren't necessarily so bad? I mean, obviously we don't want to be eating all processed foods, which tend to have a lot of carbohydrates in them, and I think that's where this notion comes from. But why aren't carbohydrates as a macromolecule the enemy, especially when it comes to the brain's function? Mm -hmm. So on a typical day, your brain wants to use about 100 grams of carbohydrate to just function. It's the energy that your brain likes to use. And it's required for your red blood cells as well. So you do need to ingest, well, your body needs to have some glucose in order to function. And usually we just eat that in the forms of starches, which can be in vegetables, whole grains, legumes, fruits. Yeah. So you need to have the, the glucose in order for your, your brain to function. Now for people who have special medical conditions, like they have epilepsy, intractable seizures as a child, the ketogenic diet can be used therapeutically for them to reduce their symptoms long-term and maybe reduce or even stop their epilepsy medications because the brain can eventually switch over to using fat or to use these ketone bodies, which can cross the blood brain barrier and the brain can use ketones as a source of energy. Yeah. Okay. So I should say in normal conditions, the brain only uses glucose. All right, if you're out for that out and back walk and only have 15 minutes, that is your cue to turn around. But in the ketogenic diet, we're basically hacking our metabolism to use fat as a source of energy for the brain. Got it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty trendy as a, as a diet tool now, you know, I feel like everyone's been talking about it on Facebook when they're talking about just different diets that they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to use with the new year. Mm -hmm. But historically, the purpose and the reason why it was used was not for, for weight loss, but more for epilepsy treatment. Exactly. Yeah. That's the traditional use of the ketogenic diet, especially in children is for a treatment of intractable seizures. Got and it. if a child is going to be put into ketosis, they'll actually go inpatient to a hospital for maybe okay. a few days or a week because there is a lot of changes that are going to happen that need to be under medical supervision. Got it. Yeah. Once so, they leave the hospital, they can transition to a modified Atkins or another form of a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, but it wouldn't be like the true keto diet with the different ratio of like the four to one, which would mm -hmm. be four parts fat to one part protein and carbohydrate. You can do a three to one ratio or two to one ratio or one to one ratio. So yeah. <laughs> Got it. So originally the ketogenic diet was used to help treat those who were having these seizures and it's been successful in doing that. But any idea as to how it became the latest weight loss diet? And I mean, I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that anytime we're eating a lot fewer carbohydrates or losing a lot of water weight, but curious as to your insights on if you have any and how it might've become this popular diet for weight loss purposes. There's two things. Number one, yes, when you first initiate a ketogenic diet, you will lose a lot of water weight because the storage molecule glycogen, it loves water. And so when you're using up all your glucose, you'll be releasing all of the water that's bound up together with the glucose in the storage molecule. Got it. So your body's breaking mm -hmm. down that glycogen because it doesn't have access to the glucose that it would be storing that was coming from your diet. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that our population now is there's more incidence of insulin resistance. So that means that people who have been following a standard American diet, their bodies are unable to utilize glucose effectively. And a low carbohydrate diet is actually really beneficial for them. Let's see how to put this. So since they're resistant to insulin, their cells are not able to take up the glucose effectively and use it very well. Mm -hmm. So low carbohydrate diet will help them because your blood sugars improve when there's not as much glucose rolling around in your cells that's not being able to use, be used effectively. Mm -hmm. So think if you're having carbohydrates, you have like a high blood sugar and the blood sugar is not able to get into your cells and be used as energy sure. if your insulin's not working very well. So if you're taking in less carbohydrates, your blood sugar is lower, your energy is more level, and you're able to utilize the glucose that you do take in more effectively. So I think people who are using the keto diet for weight loss, a good candidate for keto or a high fat, low carbohydrate diet would be someone who has insulin resistance. And you can actually go to your doctor and say, like, can you test my blood sugar and test my liver function and my pancreatic function and see what's going on here? Because, you know, I feel sluggish and I'd like to know if I'm insulin resistant. And usually they can look at some biomarkers and tell you how well you are able to metabolize glucose and they can refer you to a dietitian who can help you with a low carb diet. Got it. So do you think then, I mean, is a ketogenic diet something that's safe and what might be some of the long-term effects of that? Is a ketogenic diet safe? I think for children who are initiating the ketogenic diet, safety is a huge concern. Mm. That's why they have to go inpatient. For adults, safety is a moderate concern. Of course, you're free to do your, with your body what you'd like to do. But it would be good for your doctor to know if you're going to go on a ketogenic diet just to make sure that you're getting all the nutrients that you need, especially working with a dietitian would be helpful. I'm looking at the daily breakdown of like what you would eat in a day, maybe mm -hmm. incorporating like beef tallow and lots of saturated fats, even if they come from plant sources. We have a lot of scientific literature backing up that that can be atherosclerotic, which means it's not good for your veins and arteries. Mm -hmm. So that's a concern for me, especially since the diet doesn't really include any legumes, beans, or grains. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a lot of research showing that whole grains and legumes are super beneficial for your gut microbiota and your overall cardiovascular health. Right. It's super helpful. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, tend to be suspicious of any diet that wants to cut out legumes and whole grains. But that being said, for some people, this could work really well for them. Mm -hmm. Got it. So just, it would be just depending on the client themselves, but if someone looking, looking to use the ketogenic diet for weight loss purposes, because their friend did it, maybe, maybe not the best reason to, to just jump exactly. on the bandwagon. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, think about this diet or any diet, mm -hmm. is it going to be sustainable long-term? Does it give you life? Are you excited mm -hmm. about it? Or are you just excited about the number on the scale going down? Mm. Yeah. I love that way of thinking about it. And I know for me, when I saw all these posts and the reason why I wanted to have you on about the keto diet and friends asking friends if they had tried it and what the results were and people replying that they had gotten great results for weight loss was this idea of you know, every year there is some diet and trying to encourage people to think back to their friends who went on last year's fad diet and was that actually sustained. And some of these diets that were popular in the past seem really silly now, like the grapefruit diet, rice diet. And then like in the <laughs> 80s, it was all about low fat. And now right. it's all about like paleo and not eating gluten and not eating grains and the grain brain and the grain belly. Yeah, I think these diets just sort of crop up and then they fade away and hopefully we make it through in a healthy state. <laughs> uh, pretty much, right? 
So Sarah, one thing I wanted to ask you about the keto diet and just our diets in general, so even if someone's not interested in going on the keto diet, is fruit. Is fruit something that we should be eating? Is it way too high in sugar? Obviously, it's not really present very much, if at all, in the keto diet. But I know as a personal trainer, I eat a lot of fruit. And people are often telling me I shouldn't because if I want to be healthy, fruit has way too much sugar and I really shouldn't have much, if at all, any in my diet. So love to have you help us set the record straight on that. What should we be doing with fruits? Yeah, well, fruits are great. Plants are great because they contain all these amazing phytonutrients and phyto just means light. So plants use light as a source of energy and they create themselves from the sun, which is amazing. But anyway, (laughs) these phytonutrients, there's research all over the place about the the specific phytonutrients in different plants like mushrooms and raspberries and cherries, all the things that give plants their colors. These pigments tend to reduce certain forms of cancer or reduce the incidence of them the or the, the rates of cancer. Some of them increase your insulin sensitivity, which could be a concern for someone who's looking at the ketogenic diet. They're hugely beneficial for even cognitive function. Yeah, there's a lot of research for like in Alzheimer's looking at the dark berries in terms of cognitive performance. And that's the pigment of the cherry or the elderberry or whatever the thing is that they're studying in their study. So yes, having as many fruits in your diet and the range of colors, because each color does a different thing, Mm -hmm. is super helpful and can improve your longevity and your quality of life as you age. Those are important things to think about. So as a dietitian, when I'm sitting with a patient, I'm thinking like, how is this going to impact you long-term? I don't want you to be happy with me like in two weeks when you've lost a lot of weight and then unhappy 20 years from now. But like, let's look at the long-term arc of your life. Mm. And even working with athletes too, because you always want to think about well, this may improve your performance now, tomorrow, but are you going to have a heart attack in two months because you've been taking this crazy supplement or, (laughs) you know, so we want to like look at the whole picture of like putting together a diet that's really going to work for someone. Mm, Totally agree with you there. And now I'm going to make us go well over 15 minutes because I have another question that you jogged my memory on, which is the connection between the keto diet and performance for endurance athletes. Any insights or research that you've come across regarding that connection? Does going on the keto diet help improve an endurance athlete's performance? So there have been some ultra endurance athletes, like athletes who run 100 mile races or more, Mm -hmm. who have tried a ketogenic diet to improve their performance and have anecdotal evidence of that helping them, you know, once you get past the one or two hour mark, having beneficial performance. And so those people have enjoyed it. And I know it's a huge trend because athletes are always looking for that. Like, what's that one thing that's going to give me the edge over the right. next person, <laughs> but you can change from mostly using glucose to mm-hmm. mostly using fat. And since we carry around much more fat with us than we do glucose, there's a benefit for a long term. But the studies that I've looked at, they haven't actually improved the performance. They've been the same as the performance of someone who was eating a traditional diet, okay, a high carbohydrate diet. So I'm not totally convinced that their performance has improved. They've definitely changed their respiratory exchange ratio. They're able to adapt to a different ratio, but they're not necessarily able to move faster. You need glucose or glucose helps you to fuel when there's a deficit of oxygen. So when you're on a full out sprint, you're Mm -hmm. only burning glucose. And when you're on a full out sprint, you can only burn it for 15 seconds Mm -hmm. before you need to stop and re-catch your breath. So you can't really go super fast just burning fats. And it's important when you're training to adapt to being really good at burning carbohydrates because that's how you're going to be faster. Got it. Um, Yeah. So a carb high carbohydrate diet paired with high intensity interval training is going to teach your cells to build more mitochondria and to more effectively store glycogen. 
or to store glucose in the form of glycogen to make mm-hmm. bigger glycogen molecules in your body. So you're like really fueled up to when you need that extra burst of energy to sprint, that the glucose is there, it's available. Your mitochondria knows how to use it and you have that ATP ready and available for you. Got it. So, so definitely there needs to be more research done to see if it would actually improve sports mm-hmm. performance, even though it might mm-hmm. be able to help us change the way we're, we're having our metabolism work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. More research for sure. One last thing I want to ask you about, Sarah, is that I keep being approached by people who want me to sell supplements that are supposed to help people get into ketosis. Any insights into these products? I would never sell them myself, but just for our listeners who might be thinking about taking them. Mm-hmm. Would, would you want to buy exogenous ketones in order to help you get into ketogenic uh, state faster? Well... I don't know. I mean, some people talk about being in mild ketosis versus full-blown ketosis. And I don't know if that's real or not, or if you're just in ketosis or you're not in ketosis. Um, Mm. I'm not sure about that. But uh, if you're willing to commit to a ketogenic diet, then commit to it and do it and see how it works. I don't think you'd need to buy endogenous ketones for energy. I mean, your body stores so much fat that even in like a person with like 20% body fat or super low body fat, you're going to have a lot of fatty acids available to make these ketones. I don't know if I would sell them myself, but you know, if someone (laughs) else is doing it, that's fine. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. So I guess it's just like with anything we're trying to do, any way of eating, more important to get those nutrients and and what we're seeking from the way we're eating versus and hopefully whole fruits and vegetables versus a pill. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> actually come to think of it, if you're in ketosis and eating a ketogenic diet, I'd be more concerned with supplementing you with vitamins and minerals than anything else. Mm, right. For I the would say lack of fruits and vegetables. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> calcium, vitamin D, mm. a multivitamin with minerals and trace minerals. Got you it. may need to have like a probiotic, mm-hmm. phosphorus, magnesium, selenium, all those things that you would be getting from fruits and vegetables that you're not getting in a ketogenic diet. Got it. Mm-hmm. So I guess to close out, would you recommend it for any of your clients? <laughs> I would be curious as to why they wanted to start one mm, and yeah. ask them about it and see. I, I'd probably, if they did want to go keto, I'd probably refer them to a dietitian that does keto because there are right. dietitians out there that work with the ketogenic population. So I'd probably try to connect them with someone who would do that. But I wouldn't say like, no, let's never do a keto diet for anyone. But yeah, I would be curious as to why they wanted to start one and probably refer them out. Sure. And maybe, and maybe it's for more of the, for someone that, you know, was looking for treatment for epilepsy, or maybe that they had some insulin resistance or people that might, might be good candidates versus just general, Mm -hmm. just because your friend was doing it reasons. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or even if they had... I know there's a dietitian that, who's a colleague of mine who uses them in treatment of migraines. People who okay. have like really bad migraines. Hmm. So, yeah. Something with the brain connection maybe that's, that's there Absolutely. that we don't know about yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, I really appreciate you being here, Sarah, and staying a little longer than the planned 15 minutes. Wanted to give you an opportunity to share where people can find you and connect with you. And I know, like you were saying, that the ketogenic diet is not your specialty. So I want people to know about what you do focus on. So if they wanted to reach out, they can learn more and maybe even work with you. Okay, sure. Yeah, you can find me. I'm on Instagram at Soful Nutrition, S-O-U-F is in Frank, L is in Larry Nutrition. And I have a Facebook page and that's Soful Nutrition and my website is SoFulNutrition.com. And I'm a general dietitian and I work with a lot of families and kids and I take pictures and, and post about my garden and sustainability, which is a passion of mine. So yeah, I'm in Redondo Beach. I like to work locally. 
Mm -hmm. I like to dig into my community where I live. And so that's how I know Catherine because she's here in Hermosa. Yep. Awesome. And I know you really do do a lot of in-person events. So what is the best way for people to find those if they are local to the South Bay? Usually you post everything on Instagram pretty much when you have an Mm -hmm. event. Yeah, pretty much Instagram. It's all in there. (laughs) Very cool. Well, thanks. I'm so happy to be here too. Thanks so much for the conversation. I'm really glad that there are trainers out there who are interested in nutrition and wanting to get good information from from dietitians it's really great to collaborate with you so thank you so much oh well, thank you well, I'm, i definitely as we we've been chatting for longer than the podcast episode for those of you who don't know because i have so many questions and i'm and i sometimes i think i should go back and and do some more schooling because it's so fascinating to me just well because you know I guess the way our bodies work when we're moving is definitely tied to what we put into them for, for fuel, right? So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lots of connections there, but awesome. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. And uh, yeah, appreciate you being on the podcast. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the fit 15 for show notes and more visit fitarmadello.com slash podcast. See you next time.